We live in a world that's filled with ways for us to communicate, whether that's through phone calls or text messaging or email, and there are all sorts of ways that we can communicate with one another. We also can communicate with our Heavenly Father, and the primary way that the Bible says that we do that is through our prayer lives. The Bible's filled with examples of people from both Old and New Testament who reached up and reached out to God in prayer. Whether we're thinking about Daniel in the lion's den or Jonah in the belly of a fish or Jesus on the cross or even in the Garden of Gethsemane, people often pray to God. We know that we should pray, but the struggle we often have as human beings is what do we say when we finally have God's ears? 1 Peter 3 and verse 12 says that God's eyes are over the righteous and his ears are attentive to our prayers. But isn't it the case that we find ourselves on occasion tongue-tied as we approach God in prayer? There are certain models and certain templates that we have, but maybe some of those don't work for us. What are some things that we need to be saying to God regularly? What are some things that need to be included in our prayer lives on a regular basis? Study with us together on Light of the World as we look at seven things we should say to God every day. You know, early on in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 4, we read in verse 26 that men begin to call on the name of the Lord. And that call begins and it runs throughout the pages of Scripture. We read about people like Elijah and Daniel and Moses, Hannah, Mary, Jacob, Ezra, Nehemiah, Paul, Peter, and even Jesus crying out to God in prayer. There are several reasons why we need to pray and countless passages that instruct us to do so. Prayer is one of those things that God expects his people to be engaged in. That's right. You think about how Paul, in that very succinct phrase, says, pray without ceasing. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17, don't be anxious for anything, but by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. Philippians 4, 6, literally throughout the New Testament, there are these drives, these admonitions for us to pray. That's right, and we should do it on a daily basis. Sometimes we struggle with exactly what we should be saying, and you think about Jesus and his apostles in Luke 11 or Matthew 6, 9 through 13, and Lord, teach us to pray and help us to pray. And Jesus gives them that model prayer, if you remember about our Father who is in heaven, and walks them through this, basically this outline, this template for prayer and helping us to have some things that we need to say to God. Some people have taken that model prayer and they'll pray it verbatim, and while there's nothing wrong with that, God wants us to pray to him every day, but he's not interested in vain repetition. He's interested in us genuinely pouring out our hearts to him and communicating with him on a regular basis. You know, I think there's a lot of us that may feel like the disciples in Luke 11 and verse 1 and, and would say to God, to his son, through his word, you know, Lord, teach us to pray. I feel like that's an area that I want to always be growing in and I feel like I'm always needing to improve in is my prayer life. And I think there are a lot of folks who are watching us who may feel the same way that I feel. Are there some things that you can do to help us or say to us that can help us with that most important discipline in our life of prayer? Absolutely. There are some basic statements and phrases, concepts that should be true of us in our prayer lives on a daily basis. These aren't in any particular order, but maybe some things we should be sure to include and not leave out. The first one would be, we should tell God we love him. I love you. Now, we know that God loves us. We think about Jesus' death on the cross. We think about 1 John 4 and verse 8 and being told that God is love and we love in response to God's love. 1 John 4 and verse 19, we love because he first loved us. But God needs to hear us saying to him and we need to hear ourselves saying to God that we do love him and that we cherish him. And this is one of those things to say to God every day in our prayers. God, I love you. That's right. You know, when you think about how Jesus boils it down to its most basic and essential uh, observance of how we live with him. He says to us, Jesus challenges us, quoting from uh, the Shema, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your might and with all your strength. In Matthew 22, 37 and 38, and love you know, our neighbor as ourself. And part of that loving God is to express it and to tell him. You think about a husband who would say to his wife, well, I really love you and you see it in my actions, but you don't have to read through that behavior because I'm never going to tell you. We want it shown in actions, but we often also want it said with words. So twice in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 18, with the superscription above it telling us it was when God delivered David from all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul, the first thing David says is, I love you, O Lord, my strength. And then in Psalm 116, 1 and 2, there's this same expression, I love the Lord. 
And then in 1 John, John says, we shouldn't tell God we love him while we hate our brother who we have seen and love God whom we haven't seen. But underlying John's statement is just this assumption that we are saying the words. We should couple that with love for our fellow man. But John just assumes that telling God we love him or saying we love God is something that would be on the lips of God's people. So when we think about things that will help us in prayer and things we need to say, this has to be in the list. Okay. All right, so I, I see that, to express that to God, I love you, will really help our prayer life. What else would you suggest? Along with I love you, there has to be this spirit of giving thanks. In the United States and in several other countries, but not all, there's an annual holiday of Thanksgiving where we get around a table and in the United States it's become more common to be focused primarily on football and fat back and family. We just get together and we focus on those things. But initially in our country, Thanksgiving was about gratitude for God for his blessings and the things that he's done. And when you read throughout scripture, you find this being commanded of us by God through the apostles and others that people that have received so much good from God what return appreciation to God. We can never repay them, but by expressing our gratitude and telling God, thank you. Well, when I think about what Paul tells us that a spirit filled life is a life that is gonna be demonstrated by giving thanks. Ephesians chapter five and verse 20, it tells me how important this is to God. That's right. You think about Paul saying in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. There are a lot of things in the will of God that are complicated maybe somewhat or difficult or challenging, we'll say, but this is one of those things that doesn't, you don't have to have a high IQ, you don't have to be educated or rich or in shape or any of those things to be in every circumstance giving thanks. He doesn't say for everything give thanks, but in every circumstance, we can find a reason. And there are countless examples. You've got Miriam in Exodus 15, David in 1 Samuel. There's Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 2. And all of these individuals who've received from the benevolent hand of God. And in turn, they've responded to God with hymns and odes of thanksgiving. And we ought to add ours to the list. We ought to be people that are expressing our gratitude to God. I read a book on prayer called Cat and Dog Theology by Sorgen and Robinson. And they said that in the end, every human being has either cat theology or dog theology. And if you have a cat or a dog, you might appreciate what they mm -hmm. said about this, but they said cats are sort of individuals that look inward at themselves and dogs are owner pleasers. If you feed a dog and clothe the dog and take care of it and walk the dog, the dog just surmises in his or her mind, you must be God. But a cat mm -hmm. is the opposite. A cat says, if you clothe me and shelter me, feed me and provide for my needs, then I must be God. And the book says that every one of us is one of those two things, either a cat or a dog, theologically speaking. We either view ourselves as the one responsible for everything we have, or we view God as the one responsible. And if we have the proper theology that says, God, you feed me, you clothe me, you shelter me, you sustain me, you've given me my very life, the only proper thing to express to God in response is, thank you. You know, I think about in Luke 17, Jesus does this wonderful service for men who are laboring under a death sentence. They have leprosy, and Jesus heals them, and they're, they're excited. You know, Jesus tells them to go back, to go to the priests and to show themselves clean. Nine of them don't, but one of them only comes back and says, thank you. That's right. You know, the devil would have us to be deceived and think that we're the ones that deserve the credit for our existence, for all that we have and all that we are. In Romans chapter 1, Paul talks about the things that bring on the wrath of God. In Romans 1.18, he says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And then in verse 19, he talks about the things known of God are clearly seen by them being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power in God has, so that they are without excuse. That's the unbelieving world. Because although they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful they became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. What made them foolish? According to Paul, is suppressing the truth that they know. And because God has made himself known and apparent in the natural world, to deny that and to be unthankful is to be a foolish person. The devil would have us to think we have to take, we're to take credit for all that we have and all that we are. But our very breath and the very existence that we have, that we have minds to contemplate the existence at all, is a response or a 
benefit based on the God that's blessed us with that ability and given it to us. In Acts 17 on Mars Hill, Paul is talking to people that are very religious but misguided. In Acts 17, he says, it's in God that we live, move, and have our very being or existence. And based on that, we ought to render to God thankfulness. We might struggle on what to say in our prayers, but every day we should be saying to God for those things and so much more, thank you. Yeah, you know, as we're looking for a very practical way to approach our prayer life, I love you, thank you. I mean, that that's a, a great beginning, but what else can we say to God in prayer? Alongside this expression of love and this expression of thanksgiving needs to be the statement every day to God, forgive me. Hmm. Now, Christians that have been washed by the blood of Jesus, Romans 8 and verse 1 says we're not under condemnation. That is, there's not a guilty sentence hovering over the people of God. As we walk in the light, we are continually cleansed. We don't just wallow in sin and unrighteousness on a continual basis. However, we do sin and fall short of God's glory continually, even after we've obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And a part of what we do in those times is we express our forgiveness, our need for forgiveness to God. 1 John 1 and verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. On a daily basis, we should be saying to God, forgive me because we do fall short. We do stumble and he will forgive us. What do you think about David, a man after God's own heart, who was quick to say, as egregious as his sin was, he didn't try to rationalize. He said, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgression. I acknowledge my sin, it's ever before me. Isn't that the heart that God wants us to have? It is. Jesus includes this in the Sermon on the Mount in Luke ch in Matthew chapter six and verse 12. He says, we should be saying to God, forgive us our debts, as we forgive those who are indebted to us. And so one of the marks of the spiritual person is that he or she realizes their need for forgiveness. You think about the parable that Jesus told in Luke 18, hmm. verses nine through 14. Two men went up to the temple to pray, the one a tax collector, and the other individual was a heathen or a publican. And the tax collector prayed with himself, Lord, I thank you, I'm not like other men. And then he gives God basically this spiritual book report of all the things that he's done right and how God is so benefited to have him on his team but the heathen, the publican, wouldn't even lift up his eyes toward heaven. And he says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, Luke 18 and verse 13. And we can read that passage, and we might even think to ourselves as we read it, that we would never be so proud as to pray like the tax collector. But maybe mm. a better question is, will we ever be humble enough to pray like the heathen? Will we ever be humble enough to acknowledge that we're the ones who've sinned, that we've broken God's law, and that we need God's forgiveness? This Forgive me every day saying it to God reminds us that there's only been one perfect person who's ever existed and we're not him. That's Jesus Christ. And God says in Hebrews 8 and verse 12 that I'll be merciful to your unrighteousness, your sins and your iniquities. I'll remember no more. There are few things that God wants to give us as much as he wants to give us a clean conscience in relation to our sins. And so this prayer of forgiveness isn't one that should be hard for us to pray. It's one that should flow off our lips regularly, coupled with genuine repentance and a desire to do what's right in response to acknowledging sin and what's wrong in our lives. But we do need to be praying to God and asking him to forgive us. So when you look at these three that you've already mentioned to us, they really help to round out and give us a, a well-balanced prayer life. We're expressing our great affection, uh, devotion to God. We're letting him know that we're mindful of what he's given to us. We also let him know that we realize that we fall short of his glory and we want to go to a God who wants to forgive us why wouldn't we want to say these things to God every day, but, but what else? So we come to God and we express our love. We come to God and we ask God to forgive us and all of those things we do because we're thankful and we express our thanks. But a fourth thing is we ask God to help us. On a daily basis, we should say to God, help me. The truth is, in relation to this life, we're all in over our heads. Since Genesis 3 forward, we can't do life alone. John 15 and verse 5, Jesus was serious when he said, without me, you can do nothing. And Paul in Philippians 4, 13, on the positive side says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But the opposite is also true. Without him, we can do nothing. And so we need to be petitioning God for his help, for his aid. God doesn't struggle 
In Luke chapter 1 and verse 37, it says, with God, nothing is impossible. So that's the positive side. We serve a God who's never met a difficulty and who wants to be our help, who wants to come alongside us, be co-workers together, see us accomplish great things. But we've got to ask him. We've got to be willing to say, I can't do this by myself. Father, would you help me? Yeah, and, and really, if we're living life just doing what it is that we can accomplish, then we're really not challenging ourselves enough. That's, that's insufficient, right? That's right. You think about Psalm 18, and David is listing all the things. We mentioned this earlier. He starts out with his love for God, but that's because God has delivered him from all of his enemies. And in Psalm 18 and verse 29, David says, with my God, I can run against a troop. That's a whole host of individuals in an army. And by my God, I can leap over a wall. David was saying, as he's praising God, with God on my side, I can do anything. And he believed that God was willing and wanting to help him. And that's what we need to appreciate we need to see it and then we need to express it. Isaiah talks in those chapters, Isaiah 40, really through about 45, about the folly of idolatry and the foolishness of bowing down to something we've made with our own hands. And in Isaiah 41 and verse 10, God says to Israel through the prophet, I'm your God. I will help, and help you and strengthen you and hold you up. I am your redeemer. And so when we come to God and when we ask God to help us, it's what he will do. But the question is, are we humble enough to ask? You know, some people, they go to the gym and they only lift the amount of weights that they can lift without needing a spotter. They can lift that weight and they don't need any help. They lift the low amount and they may feel positive about themselves and pretty self-sufficient, but they're never going to know how much they really could lift. They're never going to know their greatest potential. And God's more than our spiritual spotter. God does more than merely help us in the times when we feel like life's too much. He's with us all the way through, but we'll never know our true spiritual potential until we ask for the aid of God who wants to come alongside us and help us lift the loads that are too heavy for us to carry. And we need so many things, things that we can't produce for ourselves, and we need God to help us, right? And God helps. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, Jehoshaphat, he's surrounded by the army. They've come in right where he is, and they're right in En Gedi, and they're right on his track, and he prays. The people are afraid, and Jehoshaphat prays in 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 12, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And in that moment when he prayed, he knew exactly what to do, and that was enough. That changed everything. We are all in over our heads, but when we look to the God who is above us, Psalm 61 says that we're to look to the rock that's higher than us, and ask for his help, God wants to do that. On a daily basis, we might face things with school, with work, and our family, our finances, our health, list of to-dos that we want to accomplish. And before we rush in and get into those things and say, well, I'll do as much as I can, and then I'll ask God to assist me when I feel overwhelmed, we should begin with, God, I want to accomplish many things today. And God, I know I won't be able to do any of it without your help. God, I need you to help me. In two words, that's the prayer of Psalm 12. Help, Lord. And that's a mm -hmm. prayer to pray, and that's enough. Okay, so I'm building my prayer life of things I say to God every day. Let me see if I have this right. Uh, I love you, thank you, forgive me, and help me. That's right. Is there something else we can add to that? Right alongside help me, it'd be helpful for us to pray every day, God help them. Help me. There's nothing wrong with praying for ourselves. Jesus did that in John 17, 1 through 5. But help them says every day we should be bringing someone else to the throne of God, praying in behalf of someone else and asking God to come alongside and help them. This is one of the things we see Jesus doing in his earthly ministry. We see the apostles doing it later. And it's something we can do for other people. Now, we can't pray for everybody all the time but we can always be praying for someone. And every day, what if we took somebody's name with us into our prayer closets and prayed for God to be of assistance and aid toward them? So if we understand how much we've been helped, that compassion that we should feel for somebody else should realize that, that they need that help too. That's right. Jesus in Luke 22, you remember he tells Peter, he says, Peter, I've prayed for you that your faith fail not, and when you're converted, strengthen the brothers. Jesus prayed for Peter. Paul requests the prayers of other Christians, but one of the things that Paul often did in the beginning of his letters, Paul would tell churches that he's praying for them. 
He would write them and then he would tell them, I'm thankful that prayers have been answered. I've been praying for you unceasingly, nonstop. He does it in the book of Romans and 1 Corinthians. He does it in 1 and 2 Thessalonians to the Colossians who he had never seen before to individuals like Timothy and like Philemon. Paul was always bringing other people before the throne of God and we need to find ourselves doing the same thing. You think about the list of people in your life and in my life that need our, need our petitions, need God's help, and who we can be praying for. And one of the best things we can do for people is to pray for them. Well, something I've learned from you that's been very helpful, and now I do it, is uh, a suggestion that you gave a while back when you were preaching at Lehman Avenue. You, you talked about we have a church directory, and a lot of folks have that, that have the names of individuals and families and how you pray through the directory and how you pray uh, for specific needs that you're aware of, you know, and you make contact with them and then you find out more about what's going on. And that just accentuates what you could put in your prayers for each of those families when you go through again. It is a tangible way for us to put this into practice, to ask God to help those specific individuals. But what else? What else can we say to God every day when we pray to Him? We pray to God and we ask Him to help others. And then the next thing we can say to God is, God, let me serve. If we want God to help other people, one of the ways that God's going to answer that prayer is through the service that we render to individuals. We are to be, as is often said, the hands and feet of Jesus in the world, but we ought to be praying to God for open doors so that we can walk through those doors and serve. You think about Paul in Colossians chapter four and in 2 Thessalonians chapter three, he says, brothers pray for me that doors may be open and that the word of the Lord may have free course. And Paul was looking for those open doors and we ought to be praying for those opportunities as well. Right, when we think about who we are to God, we are those who have been made free, but we're not to use that liberty as an occasion to our flesh, but by love we're to serve one another. Galatians 5.13 or Romans 12 and verse one, we're servants who are to use ourselves doing what's that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's our reasonable service. In Matthew 25, Jesus gives a picture of the judgment scene. And you remember in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, he says, it'll be like a shepherd separates sheep from goats. And those individuals that are on the side of the goats, they'll be shocked, they'll be surprised because what they'll hear on that day is depart from me because all of these needs were present and they didn't address those needs. Instead, they'll say to Jesus, when did we see you naked or in prison or in need of something? And Jesus will say, what you didn't do for the least of these, you didn't do it for me. And so what we should be praying is, God, give me open eyes to see, an open heart to help, and open hands to serve, that I will get out and do what I can. We should look for needs, and when we see those needs, we'll be able, if we pray for open eyes to see needs, we'll see they're ever about us. Again, we can't do it all, but we should be praying for God to allow us to serve. It's like a kid on a little league team. He doesn't really care, he just wants to be in the game. As long as the coach doesn't sit him on the bench, he'll be happy, whatever his contribution to the team. And what we're praying to God when we pray, let me serve is, God, don't sit me on the bench, put me in, let me serve. I want to be of use for you as long as I can, as often as I can for your people and for your glory. You know, in the book of John, uh, John records Jesus' public ministry in chapters one through 12. But then from 13 to 17, you see Jesus focus in on his disciples and he's really gearing them up for how they could be his hands and his feet in this world. And it's remarkable to me that the way he introduces this, all that he's going to say, is uh, at that meal that they're taking together, he girds the towel of the servant. And he gets down and he washes their feet. And he says, you call me Lord and Master. And you say, well, for so I am. If I then your Master and Lord have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. When we serve, we are imitating the greatest of all, the greatest servant of all, Christ. And Jesus tells them in the end, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Now, it's one thing to know those things, but it's a different thing entirely to put it into practice. And so in that prayer, we're praying that God would help us to have the heart, the desire, the will, and the courage to pick up our towel. We should be praying to God, help me to wash someone's feet, proverbially speaking. Look, help me to look out and see somebody who will be able to let me and allow me to serve them in order to be a servant. We don't need a stage. We just need a servant's heart that says, I'll do whatever needs to be done. So seven's a perfect number in the Bible. So why don't you give us a seventh thing that we can say to God every day? 
One of the last things we can say, and again, these aren't in any particular order. You can say them in any order at any time, but we should be praying to God to remind us. Praying, God, remind me. Now, there's a host of things we need to be reminded about, but we need to appreciate that the human mind, the ability to remember, in some ways is awesome, but in other ways, it's sad how quick we can forget the good things that have flown into our lives and been given to us by God. And so we need to pray that God would help us not to forget all of the things that he's done for us. We read in the Old Testament about Old Testament Israel, and they were extremely forgetful. And we don't want to fall into that same trap. Hosea 13, 5 and 6 says about ancient Israel, when they were full, full and when I blessed them, they forgot me. And that led to their idolatry and wickedness and ultimately their captivity. And if we don't want that to be true about us, we should be praying that God remind us. Well, what else should we be reminded of besides the way he's blessed us? We should be reminded of God's character, who God is. As soon as we hear the word of God and we go out into the world, the world would like to deceive us about who God is. And we need to be praying that God would remind us of his steadfast love, of his forgiveness, of his compassion, but also of his righteous indignation. Praying that we remember who we are. We don't get our mm -hmm. identity. We don't get our enoughness from the world. It doesn't come from outside. It comes from up above and from who God is. And we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. We need to be reminded of who we are. We need to be reminded of where we stand with God. If we're in Christ, God is the one who's forgiven us. 1 John 3 and verse 20 says, that if our hearts condemn us, God's greater than our hearts and God knows everything. And so we need to be reminded that God is a God who forgives us. We also need to be reminded about what's most important and among what's most important is where we're going. And, and just this very practice of praying to God every day is going to keep us anchored in our thoughts on the eternity that's to come, right? That's right. Another thing to be reminded of is how short our time is. In Psalm 89 and verse 47, right before Psalm 90, where we read, God is from everlasting to everlasting, the psalmist prays, and he mentions this in Psalm 89 and verse 47, Lord, remember how short my time is and that you've made all men vain. That is, I only have a limited time to do the things that matter most. I only have a limited time to influence the world and those in my sphere of influence for good. I only have a limited time to give myself over to the things of eternal significance. And so remember how short our time is. That means our suffering is momentary and only the only thing that can happen to a suffering Christian at the end of this life is for his or her life to be benefited and blessed in a better way. Only Christian suffering is redemptive but also remember how short our time is so that we don't get caught up in sin or in worldliness or the passing pleasures of sin, which ultimately won't pay off. So real quickly, give us those seven things that we can say to God every day. Every day we should be telling God that we love God. We should be telling God every day that we're thankful for everything that God's done for us. We should be praying to God and asking for God's forgiveness, asking for God's help for ourselves, God's help for others. We should be praying to God and asking for God to remind us of the things that matter most. And we should be praying to God and telling God that we want to serve in his kingdom. God wants to hear from us every day. God delights when we pray to him. And there's many, there are many things we can say to God in prayer, but these seven are things that should be regularly a part of our prayer life to God. And when we say these things to God, we'll find our lives more blessed as a result. Thank you for watching Light of the World today. Perhaps as we have talked about prayer and you have looked at the relationship that you have with God or maybe areas in which you want to grow in that, we can be of service to you. We'd love for you to reach out to us in the various ways that we make available to you. We would invite you to go to our website, lehmancoc.org, and you'll learn more about who we are and how you can be a part of our services. You can reach us by email at lightoftheworldbgky at gmail.com. Call us at 270-843-8435 or worship with us. Our times are on the website or watch us here again next week at WNKY, Light of the World, 630 and 1030 a.m. every Sunday.